Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Rachel Heaton. Um, I am a member of the Muckleshoot tribe here in Washington State. I'm also a descendant of the Duwamish people, the first people um, of Seattle. And um, I'm also a co-founder of Mazaska Talks. And uh, I'll also have my other co-founder on here, Matt Rimley, here shortly. Um, Tonight we are doing, as I, I guess, in the days of these, this pandemic and things that we're, we're dealing with, um, we're utilizing these new ways of communicating with the world and getting our information out there and, and, and things. And so um, today, I'm, Mazda Scott Talks, first of all, we want to thank um, everybody who's on the panel tonight. You guys are going to hear from some amazing uh organizers, writers, hip hop artists. I mean, just a mix of just amazing people that are doing really great front lines work. And um, we're in a time right now where um, the conversation of, of Black Lives Matter is, is, is the conversation. And, and uh, Mazda Scott Talks is generally, um, we, we talk about um, the indigenous community, um, the fossil fuel industry, divestment, and all of the things related to issues that particularly um, um, are in our communities. Um, however, police brutality is something that we're extremely familiar with. Um, our women and missing and murdered indigenous women, our, our children going missing. And, and so again, this isn't to stay on here and to highlight these issues. What it is is that we always want to have the conversations because we can relate with the struggles of our black relatives and um, being able to have these conversations and bridge these um, solidarities, I guess, is, is, is one way of putting it. Um, Mazda Scott talks, even though that we focus on community of indigenous people, indigenous rights and all of those things, our black relatives um, are still oppressed by the same system that that we are and so when, tonight we're going to have the opportunity to talk about what is defunding the police look like what is um what what is the work of these people um doing right now that you're going to see tonight and um so Mazda Scott Talks wanted to use our platform to elevate black voices and and, um, and to show that black lives do matter and that this work is important to us and how do we build solidarity. And so um, uh, I'm gonna actually pass it on to Matt Rimley right now and he's going to add on a little bit more of, of why we've chosen to utilize our platform in this way. And then we're gonna get on to all of the amazing speakers that we have on here tonight. And then uh, before we go, I want to thank our amazing technical person, Selectiona. She has got us so that we're all set up and you'll be able to see all of us and hear us. And um, this doesn't happen with just one or two of us. This happens with, with so many of us and it happens with community. And you'll hear that through everything that these, that everyone on here is going to share tonight. And so Matt and I are simply just here to introduce you to these folks. So tonight, the, this is about them and what the work that they're doing. And, um, and so we'll just briefly introduce them and uh, they're going to tell you the work that they're doing. And then also we're going to have a Q&A and this will give you a chance to talk about what does solidarity look like? How can we contribute? What are ways that we can help and, and connect with one another and then get involved with one another's work? So, um, so yeah, so go ahead and pass it on to Matt. Charles Remley, Donna Harrison, Wana Seattle Elwati. Thank you, Rachel, uh, and uh, thank you, especially to our uh, incredible panelists and speakers that we have on here today. Um, uh, my name is my English name is Matt Remley. My Lakota name is Wakia Wanatan. I'm a Honkapa Lakota from Standing Rock, but live in uh, Seattle. My parents are Charles Remley and Donna Harrison. Um, just brief uh, welcome, and uh, I'm excited to, to hear from community organizers, community leaders uh, from across the country who are doing uh, amazing work on uh, issue of Black Lives Matter, addressing police violence, defunding the police, and so many issues. So. 
Um, I'm going to hand it uh, back to Rachel. I'm going to be quiet for the most part. And uh, uh, if you got any questions, please throw them into the chat. We'll uh, direct those towards the end. And uh, we're going to get this thing going. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, pass it over to our, our first speaker. Um, this is an amazing his family, his amazing brother, um, doing great work. Um, a lot of his work is around organizing, around education, uh, elevating youth, um, shutting down youth detention centers, and also um, on the front lines these days out in Seattle. And um, I, he, he's going to be able to tell you guys more about what he's doing, but we could sit here all day and talk about <laughs> what each one of these guys do. So. Um, Jarrell, and, and we know him as Rel Be Free. He's going to go ahead and tell us what he's doing in this community. And uh, thank you for being here with us today and go ahead and pass it over to you. What's good? Can y'all hear me? What's up, y'all? Reporting live from South Seattle right now. Uh, I'm off the corner of Rainier and Graham, which is actually like up the street from the middle school that I grew up going to. Uh, so um, a lot of my work, and just like energy is definitely still expended in the neighborhood that raised me. Um, and that's like very important to me um, because I, yeah, I grew up in a neighborhood where there's not a lot of young folks that have other young folks involved in organizing and education and really staying in the neighborhood to elevate them. And so um, I'm honored to be on this panel. I got a lot of respect for everybody that's here um, and just knowing the history of the Northwest as well as the history of African diaspora folks in the United States. Um, I think it's really important that we're having this uh, intersectional conversation right now. Um, and now more than ever, we need to be connecting. Um, so some of the work, I don't know if I can call it work because it's part of my life, it's my passion, I love it. It also stresses me out sometimes, you know, but that's, that's also a part of it. Um, it's centered around education. Um, a few years ago, uh, a few friends of us, we decided that we really wanted to create an impact in the neighborhood um, by creating a platform for young people to organize off of. Um, we started a program called Freedom Schools. Um, we started doing a summer program, which really centered um, identity formation for black young folks in this neighborhood, um, trying to continue the process of self-actualization through education and self-knowledge and self-love, um, through literacy, through using the ability to read and using um, fiction and storytelling and narrative and the arts to really find your own story and tell your own story. From all of that, it transformed into year-round programming at the local high school, Rainier Beach High School, as well as an elementary school, um, Emerson Elementary School um, in the neighborhood. Uh, and so with, that's one level. So I work with like high schoolers and my crew, we be tapped in with the high schoolers, the like 14 to 18 year olds. And then the other level, is really um, on a community level, building with the young adults, um, because whether or not you graduate from high school, there's some expectations when you turn 18. Um, and young folk are usually trying to get out their house, they're trying to get a car, they're trying to get a credit card, um, a job, an apartment. You gotta, you're being told you have to vote, but no one ever taught you how to vote. You're being told you have to do your taxes, but no one ever taught you how to do your taxes. Um, and so uh, with the Rainier Beach Action Coalition, that's another group that I've organized with that actually my dad started. So shout out to Pops. Um, we really wanted to start investing in how do we elevate the young adults. We call them yadas, young adults transitioning to adulthood um, and really not just giving them the skills, the soft skills and the hard skills that they may not have got out of high school, but just creating a platform for them to be radical and organized and critical of all the systems that they're basically getting bumped up against as they're transitioning out of their youthhood into adulthood. Um, and so I get a chance to really learn uh, from young people in the neighborhood over the last few years. One of the um, projects that these young folks started that I just had an opportunity to co-coordinate and support with is this uh, project called the Corner Greeters, which is an example of autonomous community safety um, it's really modeled after the Panthers, uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Their motto of how do we teach people to know the law and to protect our neighborhood because we keep us safe, police don't keep us safe. 
Um, and so these young folks have uh, put together an amazing project that's been lasting for the last five years uh, by centering the locations in the neighborhood that are most prevalent for youth crime. Um, and in those areas, they bring music, they bring food, they bring uh, wisdom and education, they, just, they bring the vibes. Um, and it, it transforms space, it transforms space. It's, it's an opportunity for other young folk to see what power they have. Um, and it's been a beautiful collaboration of some of the work that's done at the high school level uh, to see those youngins going and leading in the neighborhood when, they come, when they're in their young adults young adulthood. Um, so that's a lot of my like neighborhood based work. Um, and that's just my heart. On top of all that, not on top of all that, maybe under all that, through all that, and on top of all that, I'm also a musician. Uh, Rel V Free is not just my stage name, um, but it's kind of a young little model. Uh, Jossie know about some of my tunes. Shout out to bro, uh, Jossie. Um, and music for me is really a part of every social movement. The arts have to be a part of social movements um, because one, it's an express, it's expression. Two, there's not a social movement that's happened across the globe that didn't have music or the arts tied to it. And I especially think about um, Calypso music um, coming out of Trinidad and that being birthed directly out of specific oppression um, or even in, you know, uh, in East Asia, uh, the Khmer Rouge, um, some of the first people that were murdered throughout the genocide were the cultural workers, were the educators, were the musicians, um, were the political folks. Um, and so I believe that, as Nina Simone said, like we're inextricably tied to telling the story. Um, and that's what I really try to do in my music, um, as well as just creating vibrations because, you know, we need those, we need those good vibes. Um, right now, I'm a part of a collective called Decriminalize Seattle, which recently we've uh, kind of put out these three demands that we believe, as uh, Sister Rachel says, we can relate across so many intersections, whether we're talking about indigenous folk, whether we're talking about um, our LGBTQ family, whether we're talking about young people, whether we're talking about uh, um, Latinx folk. Uh, we can relate on a number of things, and that's definitely police brutality. That's definitely this economic uh, manipulation that is capitalism, um, the settler colonial practices um, that have colonized our minds and how we engage with each other. Um, and, and so Decriminalize Seattle has three demands that are centered around defunding the police, reinvesting in community, um, and then freeing all the protesters. In the last two weeks has been a disproportionate amount of young people, um, black and brown, that have been arrested um, for protesting. Um, and some of them are getting auto declined. Um, and so one of the demands is to immediately free them. Um, and because this isn't a secure call, I'm not gonna say any more about that because you're not exposing strategy and shit. Um, but that's definitely like an issue when it comes to our community. And in Seattle, you know, I think that black folk were like 6% of the state and 4% of King County, but in the prison, uh, industrial prison complex were 40 to 50 percent of the population. Um, so it's obvious that being in the Northwest, um, there's a target on African American bodies specifically. Um, and to wrap up what I'm saying, I think that what is very important right now um, is building solidarity across these intersectional lines. Um, it's very important, but also when we start doing that, it's going to start exposing our internal stuff. And so we act at the same time got to really be working on our internal stuff and i'm talking about like black folk working on patriarchy like black men i'm seeing it happen all over the place black men undermining black women on 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 public stages and calling out black women but you ain't calling out other black men that are being toxic like that's happening on a public stage and we got to deal with that internally um in the same way i'm sure any other intersection you know, I rarely hear other ethnicities and, and cultural groups have to talk about colorism on a public stage the way Black folks do. I rarely hear Latinx people talking about colorism. And I lived in Central America, so I know about some colorism in the Latinx community. Uh, we rarely hear about, you know, or have conversations about uh, economics um, and the different levels of uh, the way that that, uh, 
you know, impacts our communities um, and how we view each other and how we treat each other. Uh, when our people come home from being locked up, what is the stigma attached to them, even from loved ones? Um, and so these are things that I think are connected to the economic reality of being in a racialized, capitalistic, colonial uh, colony. Um, and there's a lot of different fault lines that we have to do work on to address. Um, and so this is the, where I feel like we're at a point in history where we either gonna get it right or we don't. And so that feels like a lot of pressure, but fuck it, this is what revolution is, it's pressure, it's a whole lot of pressure. Um, and I personally think that as an African American, as a person of African descent, that you know my ancestors was for forcibly brought to this, to Turtle Island, didn't ask to be brought, forcibly brought here. And over the course of the last 500, 600 years, we have contributed not only to the, to the, to the colony, um, but also the destruction of the land, but also some of the building things. And so I think that we feel, we really gotta just continue to have conversations with indigenous folk, because I think that is gonna be one of the most important, I think it's the most important uh, collaboration that African, people of African descent living on Turtle Island will have is our, is our re rebuilding that relationship with indigenous folk, because I truly believe and have studied that there were Africans that came to this island uh, Turtle Island was known in the United States hundreds if not thousands of years before European settlers came. Um, and while that's not going to be portrayed a lot in uh, mainstream academia, uh, there is pretty reputable <laughs> researches that have posited that, such as uh, they came before Columbus by Yvonne von Sertima. Um, Sheikh Ante Jacques out of Senegal is also a great scholar um, that talks about the anthropology and history of African relationship to this particular land. Um, and so to wrap up, I'm honored to be on this call. Um, I'm looking forward to learning about um, all the different ways that folks across the country um, are organizing and looking forward to learning. Um, I don't claim to be nobody's leader. I don't want to. I really build within a community. And that's really how I try to operate everything um, is build within community because at this point, we've learned from our ancestors and that single charismatic leadership model doesn't fucking work, and it never did work, and it's not gonna work. But diffuse leadership, decentralized leadership, as Ella Baker said, strong people don't need strong leaders, but we do need strong communities in order for everyone to be elevated. And so um, that's really what I wanna direct my energy and work towards um, till I turn to dust and go back into the next realm. I appreciate being here, y'all. Well, be free. Okay, you can go get my music too. You can just look up Rail Be Free and you can find the music. I wasn't going to say nothing, but I posted the link. I, I got you. I got that well, link up you. there. You. You're <laughs> supposed to. <laughs> we went to ask real quickly, you know, what, what are some ways that um, you, you, know, you, you mentioned some of the demands for uh, here in Seattle, kind of three kind of main demands? Uh, what are some ways that folks can? Um, jump in and support help with uh whether it's the defunding the police or the other mm -hmm. efforts you know word okay thank you for asking that i honestly think the best okay shout out to Sunite brown who's an amazing organizer taught me a lot uh based out she's based out of seattle i think now she's in chicago uh one of the things she really taught me was around building and dismantling um it's similar to how michael jordan said basketball is six, uh, 60 percent physical 40 percent mental um i think when it comes to building or when it comes to like organizing defunding the police is one thing that's a dismantling tactic that's trying to destroy to unlearn to undo something that has been positioned and structured to cause harm that's one side of the organizing the other side is building not the alternative but what is the community version that is trauma-informed that is historical that is uh sustainable that is going to build people up. And for example, when we talk about more, uh, moving what they call school emphasis officers or the police officers that are in the school, um, removing that, but putting in a role that heals, someone that heals, someone that is uh, equipped to de-escalate when a, a young person is heightened, um, that doesn't get their feelings hurt 
when a young person cuss at them because what are you doing if you're getting your feelings hurt from stuff like that? Um, so, and the same when it comes to defunding the police, I would say people be looking for and acknowledging the alternatives. There are plenty of people throughout the nation and the world. Nationwide, think about the Zapatistas. Locally, I gave you all an example of corner greeters and I'm sure there's probably more of alternatives, basically autonomous community safety. I think the thing is when we see these alternatives, we critique the hell out of them and we defeat the idea, even though we know the police don't work. Like the police doesn't work. It's an antiquated system and it's harming us. So pay attention to the, the community alternatives that are being built um, and contribute your brilliance to the alternative. Because if you can't contribute to the dismantling, you can't just benefit from what's built. We gotta be on, we gotta do something in some way. Um, when it comes to freeing the protesters, I think educating yourself, educating ourselves around like what actually happens when you're detained. I think if people understood how bad it is to be incarcerated, it would make people care more. But I think because people can create a distance between themselves and folks who are affected by the carceral state, uh, it allows for a cognitive dissonance or just kind of like a lapse. You know, like, hmm, I don't know about free them all. You know, you know, people are like free them, but don't free them all. It's like, no, free them all. Um, and then the investment in community alternatives. I mean, it's one thing for people to just be like throwing money on Venmo. I've been getting hit up by random white people trying to give me money. And I'm like, cool, you can give this to the A, B, and C. Um, I really think building the alternatives for the system that we want to dismantle, I think that that is just as important as dismantling them. Um, because we don't want to leave a vacancy. Um, and so I would say supporting the people that are building what's going to replace these things, community safety, with the emphasis being on us, the emphasis being on progress, the emphasis being on decolonizing and healing our communities. Um, I feel like that those are ways to get involved. And then also just like educate yourself, read books, watch stuff, listen to Real Be Free. A few ways to learn stuff. I'm kidding. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Right on. And and, and we, we all know you got to uh, go here shortly. Uh, there ha were a few questions specifically for you in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, you know, um, you got time to hang around and, and mm -hmm. uh, be available in the chat to answer some cues. That'd be appreciated. But uh, yes. Thank you for all the uh, amazing good work that you do. Um, it's always good to see you in the streets. Good to see you here. And uh, I, we're also going to get that homeschool and stuff going for our, our our youth as well, too, at one of these points. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, we Hope did talk about that. It's all good. I'm going to respond to the chef. <laughs> I can stick around for a while. I want to hear from the other panelists. Right on. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, uh, um, very on um, simply go by Queen. So uh, she, uh, Yuna Jaha, uh, Lone Wolf was born during the American Indian Movement and uh, during the uh, longest walk uh, to Washington, D.C. She is Oglala Lakota and African American. Her mother is uh, Oglala Lakota. Waun Neta uh, Lone Wolf, who was a renowned motivational speaker, uh, substance abuse and gang prevention counselor and healer. And her father, uh, who is African American, is a fine artist. Uh, there is, I, I'm gonna put it up in the chat because the, the list of things that uh, Queen has been involved with is, is substantial and has been doing amazing work on a whole variety of issues. Uh, including uh, uh, stopping the violence uh, from the police and police killings. So I'm gonna put that up in there so you can check uh, all these amazing things that she's been involved with. Uh, but I didn't want to uh, take too much time. I just wanna pass the, the mic to you, Queen, and uh, uh, share it, uh, on the good work that you are doing across the country, how people can support. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. My name is Yana Shaha Lone Wolf. I am a proud Ogallala, Lakota, Native American and Black woman. My late mother, Juanetta Lone Wolf, was from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and my father is from Brooklyn, New York. 
um, I just want to thank you all for having me on this amazing platform. It's always a pleasure and an honor to work with you all. We have been doing so many different things since Standing Rock, intertwining. And, um, and so it's just really great and, and to um, be a part of this because this is a much necessary conversation that needs to happen on, especially on this platform, um, when we're talking about Native Americans and Black lives and um, Latinx lives, you know, we are all fighting the same enemy. We're all being abused by police terrorism. And, um, and so many times um, we're not seeing our common enemy and we divide ourselves. We do. We divide ourselves in this fight um, when we are talking, when we're going up against police brutality. Um, my cousin, um, well, let me see, two, two of my cousins were murdered by police in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Um, several of my friends um, were murdered by police in various parts of the United States. So I know what it feels like to have a life that was stolen by the hands of police and that have put me on the front line of fighting against police brutality. Um, I have so many umbrellas of organizations that I, I always move and work under, you know? Um, and so, and, and it's because we all fighting the same thing, but we all are using um, different umbrellas for certain things. So I, um, I would say that growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, was the beginning for me um, on fighting against police brutality when the police um, tear gas, or, well at that time pepper sprayed me and my friends with um, with pepper spray because of the fact that they just looked at us as young um, young people that was just a threat, you know. And we, and from that we was able to get six officers fired. And since then I have been on the front line with that. Currently right now. I am in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, there is a show that on BET that has followed myself and a crew of other activists on what we do around police brutality in the last six months called Cop Watch America. It, it can now be seen on BET on, on demand, but it was on BET and I think they're showing some reruns of it now on BET. And it's basically where where and how we are using different ways to fight against police brutality. You know, I always say there's different positions in revolution, whether you are um, using tech, you know, social media, or you're on the front line, or you're doing legislation, or whatever it is, as long as it is that you're doing something. And I really see that, that right now, America is burning. The world is burning. Um, in the words of Martin Luther King, um, he said that a riot is the voice of the unheard. And everyone is sitting back and saying, oh my God, why is everyone burning up targets and Wendy's and all of this stuff? And it's because of the fact that for too long, your city, if it's burning and there's rioting and all of that is because you have ignored the people of your community. You have swept them under the rug on gentrification, moved them out the community and put other people there of classism. You have not listened to those that was sitting there talking and fighting for, on immigration issues, on police brutality, on the list goes on and on. And for the first time, America is getting an alarm clock on injustice and like, what is it? Never in my life where I thought that I would get calls from politicians saying, what, what can we do? Oh, now you want to hear me? Now you want to listen? After we have shut down your freeways and your roads and your highways and your Capitol buildings and all that for all these years, saying the same demands, no justice, no peace by any means necessary, justice for so-and-so, justice for so-and-so, justice for so-and-so, all the hashtags. Now you want to be able to start to arrest the officers that killed someone from three, four, five years ago? 
Now you want to do something now that because of the fact that your Target burned, your Wendy's burned, and your CNN building was was all types of, you know, it was vandalized. Now you want to pay attention. But you know what? Unfortunately, all that had to have happened. And we are now in a place right now. And hopefully they'll continue to listen because when today we saw Trump doing a police reform that they still don't know and understand what they're filling out and what they're doing because so many people, this is a reality check of classism. This is a reality check of power. This is a reality check for everyone that thought they was living a comfortable life of a so-called American dream. And we are now seeing the unraveling of America right before our eyes. America is, is unraveling. There is, there is documentation, and Matt, yet you know, Rachel, you know, then Josie, you know that in our, in our Declaration of Independence, it doesn't even talk about how we're not even human. If you're Native, if you're Black, we're not even human in these documentations. So, we, so we're going to continue to see the unraveling happening until it goes right back to over six, seven hundred years of, of when they came and stole America and built their government for themselves. And now, now this is all a beautiful blessing. I see it. Because just like how when the fires burn and all the farmers that are tuning in right now, that you know when you are burning the crops in order for new crops to come, you have to burn it and you to its core. And then you see a new plush. So what we're seeing is burning fires all around America because there has to be a new establishment of a new government. We have, as, in, as Native Americans, as indigenous, original people, black, brown, whatever, we all have been saying that this constitution, the Bill of Rights, do not do, is not for us. It has, I don't care how many amendments they do, it has to be written by us and for us. So we're talking about defunding, divesting from the police. There's in, in Atlanta, Georgia, we are waiting right now. We've been working so hard on a campaign for the, for the mayor to um, divest from this $217 million that is on there on the budget in the city of Atlanta to go towards the police. So we are pushing for divestment and that it, it, there, there is more money that needs to go towards more grassroots community um, organizations that are doing amazing work in the city of Atlanta. And I know that's just not for Atlanta. I know it's across the nation that everyone is looking at their budget. And then another thing is of course of eliminating the contracts with these police unions. We really have to make sure that these cities, that we are holding these count, the city councils are, uh, uh, accountable to cut the contracts with these police unions. And so I really strongly believe, I know we before we got on the call, I was telling Matt and Rachel, I was like, man, what y'all do in Washington is a blueprint that everyone that's tuning in need to see and need to examine of how they are able in our way of the as a as a lakota woman and even as a, a native we we have our medicine will which is the four directions of our people and if you are native and you say that you believe in that medicine will then you have to not just believe in it you have to live in it you have to mobilize in it and you have to everything that you do you got to make sure that the people of the four directions are all uniting together in the fight against freedom, I mean, for freedom, justice, and equality. We cannot just say that we believe in that medicine wheel before direction. We cannot just say that we're all related and we're not sitting and fighting and speaking up for people within that four direction. As myself being black in Lakota, don't not, I hope that my family and my tribal members are not just saying black lives matter because it's a trend. From this day forth, I want to make sure that we are all uniting and speaking in that way and fighting in that way. And that's just not only for natives, but even my black relatives. When you're seeing natives and family members that are being murdered by police, make sure that you get out of this, get out the hood and go to the reds and make sure that you are also helping and fighting on the front lines. 
I brought a group of Ferguson activists with me to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, when a young man was murdered at a church last, um, last, last year. And it was only five of us. And I'm going to tell you right now, on the borderline of Nebraska, Matt, they were shook. They was like, oh my God, Black Lives Matter is here. But let me tell you one thing that they are very afraid of is our unity, is our unity. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that what is more powerful than an atomic bomb is our unity. So we have to make sure that we live it, that we speak it, and that we begin to mobilize and organize in our unity of the people of the four directions. Mataki Asi, and that's all I have to say. So shy. Oh, Pilatanka, that was, oh man, that was, uh, a lot of good, good words being shared there. Thank you so much. I really like that piece on the, um, the burning the crops to bring something new. You have to burn it all down to build something new. Uh, thank you so much for, for all that you shared. And uh, same question for you, is there, what's the best way people can plug in? Plug, uh, you know, I know you got Indigenous Peoples Movement. You know, what are some ways that folks can plug in and support uh, your work and work that you're involved with? Yeah, um, continue to follow Indigenous Peoples Movement. Indigenous Peoples Movement um, is a coalition based organization, meaning that there is no tokenized leadership. Basically, everyone is all coming together from all over the world to be able to bring awareness on what's happening amongst all indigenous people of the four directions all together. So it's a hub. So um, if you would like to be a part of indigenous people's movement and um, it either starting a chapter or if you would like to use the platform of Indigenous Peoples Movement on whatever it is that, that you're doing, um, hit, a, um, hit up IndigenousPeoplesMovement.com. Thank you, and I'll get that link up uh, into the chat for everybody. And uh, pass to, to Rachel, I, who I've been enjoying watching uh, Giassi. What the heck you be walking or doing something out there, bro? So. <laughs> Pass it over to Rachel. It's our outdoor view. <laughs> we got the elder barge hair going on. <laughs> Saw the, just the shorts there for a minute. You know, like, you look like you're Listening in the neighborhood. Listening in the sun. <laughs> uh, no, it's a uh, this. This has been great so far, and and for everyone that's that's watching, you know, thank you for for tuning in and. Um, we will have this loaded up on on Mazda Scott talks and our various platforms, you know, when this is over. Um, but to move on to our, our next um, amazing panelists, we have so many on here today and um, I'm, I'm thankful for for this brother. I thankful for his friendship. I'm thankful for all of the work he does. Um, he's a member of the Suquamish and Blackfeet nations. He's a, he's a black father, author. A musician, he's jack of all trades, and he's going to tell you more about himself and um, the work that he does working um, and living both lines between being a, a native man and, and being a black man and, and the work that, that he's doing to, to also um, raise, raise the platforms that, that he's involved in. So um, we'll go ahead and um, welcome Jossie Ross. So. Thank you. Uh, okay, Tanatapi, Natanako Unagumsaka. Me tom tu tu, abskapi pakani. I come from the Blackfeet people. Um, uh, th thank you very much for having me on here with with all these folks. And uh, Rachel, unfortunately, like this is the only time I get to see you. That's terrible. Um, uh, Matt, it was nice to see you the other day. For those of you folks who do not know, basketball is a very large part of my life. My primary form of what people might call activism is actually just training young uh, Native and Black uh, uh, boys and girls to be successful at sports. Um, that's I do that every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And in fact, I'm at the track right at this moment. Um, let me see if I can show this. Uh, I, got, I got a group of... Um, Sorry, I had a call coming in. Um, I, I have a group of, of, of young folks that I'm training right now. And uh, that's why you see the activity, I'm at the track. Um, and and uh, I got a couple of young, young men from who, who drove in today from uh, the Blackfeet Res because they're getting ready to go to college and they wanna, they wanna excel and, 
Um, hopefully we can bring them to that place. Um, I, I had a sort of a, a response, um, Yanaja, to, to your, uh, your, your uh, rhetorical question of um, why Target was burning. It's called Target. <laughs> I mean, I, I, never, I never got why that was a surprise. <laughs> it's, it's called Target, stupid, not you. But like, like, yeah, you got you ought to change your name. <laughs> it, it, it seems like a perfect place um, to, to, to Target. <laughs> so, I, you know, I thought that that was interesting um, that, you know, that was a surprise. I, I actually, you know, went around to the targets in the Puget Sound area and took pictures of them all boarded up or alternatively burnt up because, yeah, this is kind of what you asked for. And you got to understand that the, the end result of capitalism, the end result of predatory economic behavior, the end result of taking advantage of people for a very, very long time is ultimately people are going to be pissed off. And that's what we're seeing right now. So, you know, my work, um, and I don't do, I just, you know, for anybody watching, I want to be very clear that, you know, I acknowledge and I want to, you know, lift up all the folks that are on this call that do work in the, in the, in the front lines and who are out there turning up and who are out there, you know, doing these strategies and stuff like that. I don't take that level of risk, and I want to be very clear about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer. And so this particular conversation about the criminal justice system, this particular uh, uh, conversation about the inequities within law enforcement. I see this every single day. And I just want to give you folks a couple stories. I don't want to talk too long, but I want to give you a couple stories about what I see firsthand as an attorney who works in the criminal justice system and who also does um, some ambulance chaser stuff, some, some you know, uh, 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 wrongful death stuff. So two weeks ago, I told this to Matt on Saturday when I saw him at the, uh, at the Capitol Hill occupied, uh, what's the last one, zone, uh, Chaz, what, uh, whatever it's called. Um, uh, and, and shout out to all those people who are doing that very, very important work to model that, you know, we don't necessarily need uh, these, these instruments that are predicated and based upon fear. Because that's all it is. Cops are based on fear. It's a figment of our imagination and it's something, and, and you know, as a parent, I parent three beautiful uh, Native and Black children. And I know that Parenting based upon fear is something that is going, you're, they're only going to not do or do the behaviors that you want to the extent that they're fearful of you. I don't want that. I want to teach them to do stuff because they truly want to do those things or because they love those things. And, and you know, they're modeling up on Capitol Hill in Seattle, the land of the Duwamish people, the, the land of self. They're, they're modeling how we can do stuff not based on fear. That's a very, very important distinction. That's a very, very important principle that we're seeing in real time. So I was explaining this to Matt the other day that two weeks ago, um, my primary work is in crim uh, criminal law. So I get people who are alleged to have done something wrong criminally, I get them out of jail. And I'm pretty good at that. Um, secondarily, I do, um, secondarily, like a low secondarily, I do, um, personal injury slash wrongful death cases. So two weeks ago, two weeks ago, normal week, um, I got offered, because this is what happens, people come to you and say, I got this case, are you interested? During that particular week, I got three wrongful death offers of people who had, and specifically when I say people, I'm talking about two black men and one native man who had been killed by law enforcement in one week. And, and I, I'm not making this up. I can give you the names. It's all public record. It's not, you know, but three in one week. My point with that, one of them, the statute of limitations, his name is a young brother by the name of Eugene Nelson, who was killed by Kemp Police Department in Washington. Um, and the statute of limitations was about to run. And, and another one, uh, was a, a young native man by the name of Stonechild Chiefstick. I took that case. And you folks will be hearing about that case. He was killed by Paulsbo Police Department um, for doing nothing worse than at a 4th of July celebration. You know what people do at 4th of July celebrations. They, they, they party, they drink. That's why it's a celebration. He was partying and drinking just like everybody else, 
but apparently he was partying and drinking well native and, and was killed by Paulsville Police Department. This is facts. These are all facts. And, and um, I, I declined one of those cases. I accepted one of those cases and one of them I'm still making a decision on because ultimately as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, I have to make determinations based upon money oftentimes. And so, you know, I can't accept every case. I just can't because if I sink too much resources into one, you have to hire investigators, you have to hire experts, all those things. Um, then, then you're broke. And that's the opposite of what the purpose is to be a business person. But my point with those stories is not even about the, the economics. It's not about that I'm an amazing lawyer or I'm a bad lawyer or anything like that. That's not the point. The point is that those were three wrongful death cases involving brown and black men that none of you folks have heard about in one week. And, and I think about to extrapolate that out to how many of my friends get offered these wrongful death cases, people getting killed by law enforcement, and we don't hear about them. So the George Floyds, the Breonna Taylors, the Walter Scotts, the Eric Garners, the, all these people that we do hear about, man, it's so beautiful. And I'm glad that they feel somewhat vindicated, their families feel somewhat vindicated that we at least raise them up that they're in the public consciousness. That's important. But there's all these other folks, men and women, largely brown, largely black specifically, and, and also native who die every single day and are nameless. We never hear them. They don't even make the newspaper because it's so common. My point is if, if we knew how often police kill us, if we knew, Target would have been burning a lot sooner than it was. Best Buy would have been burning a lot sooner than it was. The mall would have been burning a lot sooner than it was because they've been taking advantage of us for so long with impunity. And of course, of course, what's the connection? Well, this is an innocent Best Buy. This is an innocent Target. This is an innocent Gucci store. No, they're not. Guess what? The level of policing arises. It raises up near those places, these places of expensive retail, to where we're penalized and oftentimes asked questions just for shopping in the same way that any other white consumer is. Moreover, in the same way that we're shopping, in the same way that those white consumers are, we're also paying for those cops in the same way that those white taxpayers are. So picture that. Well, we're doing exactly the same activity doing exactly the same activity as these white folks there are, and they're protected, we're actually paying for people to kill us. We're paying the ticket for these fools to, to, to pull the trigger on us or to ha harass us or to arrest us unjustly. These are just facts. These are facts that I see every single day, folks. And so, you know, I, the, the, what I'm saying is everything that you're seeing right now, where these law enforcement officers, where there's an effort to de-unionize uh, these, these, these police guilds, where there's to remove them from these larger cohorts, where, where police officers are a little bit on edge right now, where these, these, every single university is trying to do something to make themselves look woke, <laughs> make themselves look like they've been down for a long time. All these retails are doing the same thing. It, I'm sorry, I was getting a call. I apologize. Where, where all these things are happening. And some folks might say, man, this looks like it's a little bit un heavy handed, like it's a little bit unjust. And I'm telling you everything, every single thing from these stores getting burnt down to these stores getting looted to, to, uh, uh, the, 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 these folks, these police officers that are getting fired to these police officers that hopefully are getting arrested. All of that is righteous. The looting is just as righteous as the police officers getting fired. Make no mistake. We don't need to apologize for those folks. One of my boys, <laughs> he will remain nameless. He told me when it first started, he told me, he said, he said, Josh, he said, Friday was for the people. He said, Saturday was for the Gucci. 
<laughs> and I said, yeah, man, go get some more. Go get some more. Because there has been, these systems are intertwined. They're inextricably linked. The protection of capital at that Gucci store is 100% linked to the over-policing and harassment and abuse that he receives as a native and black man, as I am. So I want, I want to end with the thought. Um, just uh, Rachel gave me a very gracious introduction. And um, thank you very much, Rachel. And I really do. We need to go get something to eat or see each other. Something like we're supposed to go to the track. I'm at the track now, just FYI. But um, I already did mine. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm talking. Not, I'm not working out right now. But uh, um, it, it, here's the thing. Um, Yanaja, she she queen. She 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 uh, referenced this. Um, I want to give a little bit of a challenge. And Jarrell, uh, you know, he 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 all he mentioned the different in a different way. Like this is this this whole time has absolutely made me rethink. Like, um, what what I'm supposed to do during this time while I'm not on the front lines. Um, you know, we in 2020, people say, "Well, we stand in solidarity." And solidarity is cheap in 2020. You know, you could retweet something, bumper sticker, whatever. I, this is a challenge to, and it's been a challenge to me personally because I was raised on reservations. I identify first as a native person, then as a black man. And, and it's, so it's been a challenge to me, but well, we're saying we stand in solidarity. I think we should push it one step further and say, I want to stand in sacrifice. I want to stand in sacrifice. I don't want to just be, you know, the person that says, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with what you're doing. But instead, I'm willing to sacrifice whether it's monetarily, whether it's holding my tongue when I want to make a comparison. And, and I'm telling this to the, to the native people on here, because we know that native people absolutely catch hell from law enforcement. And it's, and it's a, and it's a ap epidemic within our communities, but to hold our tongue when the subject comes up to say, you know, that, that temptation and it's there cause it's there with me to say, Oh, well, but what about native people? Because the truth is that at this moment in 2020, it's been black folks who have created this momentum toward this conversation. That's 100% facts. And so for us not to stand and sacrifice and say, okay, you know, you've been talking about this long enough off the momentum that you've created, let's spin it off to this direction. There's something really, really insidious and pernicious about that. And we have to be careful about that. And we have to know that if we stand and sacrifice with community and with people, that they will stand and sacrifice with us. That this justice is something, it's not a zero sum game. That there has to be enough. It's not going away just because somebody's using it all. There's no all of it to be used up. All of us deserve that. Every single one of us deserve that, Latinx, Pacific Islanders, Asian, white, poor white, all of that. And, and so we have to trust that if we stand not only in solidarity, but in sacrifice, that this is conversation is going to come to us. And we're going to be able to push this envelope and push toward more a global form of justice, that the work of Black liberation is inextricably linked with native sovereignty and native self-determination and native autonomy and native agency and native justice. We have to know that, we have to know that. So that's one challenge. Stand in sacrifice, not simply in solidarity. Number two, every single person on here who um, is, you know, it's been a conversation that's been coming up within our communities about the anti-blackness within native communities. And I don't want to focus on that. It's there, we know that. 
But I've been very, very heartened and very encouraged by the Native community specifically that I've seen speak out and very, very specifically say, you know what, what you folks are doing, we get it. And for everybody from the Macaw Nation to Bay Mills in Michigan, to Menominee, to, to uh, three affiliated, um, I see these, 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 these resolutions and these public statements that they wouldn't have taken before, but they are taking now that is going to, so it has a double effect. Number one, it's going to absolutely give voice to those folks who are doing the work on the front line and say, you know what? Yeah, this, this, these native people stand behind us. They stand not only in solidarity, but in, 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 in sacrifice. But number two, this is a very important effect that there's so many native and black people within Native communities that were made to feel very unwelcome. And so when those, they see those statements, they realize that not only do the people in Minneapolis or Atlanta or Seattle or Oakland, not only do those Black Lives Matter, but those Black Lives Matter within those Native communities, those matter too. And those are very, very important statements because I think all of us on this call that are mixed with Native and Black knows what it felt like to not feel like you matter within your particular Native community. So to hear it expressly that you do matter, that they see you as the same and they see you as something that somebody that's an asset and that you're included every time they talk about us, man, that's a, that, it really makes me emotional. It's a beautiful thing. And I, I guarantee that it makes those, those Native folks that are mixed with Black within your communities, it makes them feel so much more at home and it actually, probably for the first time in their life, makes them feel like they belong. So that's all I want to say. Thank you folks very much for organizing this. Thank you, everybody on the call. I truly appreciate all of you. Um, and, I, I, and when I say that, I really do, because you folks are sacrificing. I'm trying to sacrifice with you. And let's stand and sacrifice for each other. Thank you, Jossie. Um, before you go, um, really quick, you just raised some good points about um, there are families that um, a lot of that a lot of people don't know about. And so, um, is there anything that that the folks that are watching on here today should walk away with? Because one thing we've talked about is like educating people on these topics, but also the the families and the people that are affected um, by police brutality. So, is there anything before you close out that people should know? Um, about any of these families or, or any information that you think they should be walking away with before you go? We are going to be doing a couple of concerted campaigns regarding the families that we're working with in the capacity of, of uh, representing them legally. So a, a, a brother and a comrade of mine, Gabe Galanda, we're representing the, the family of Stonechild Chiefstick. And um, that's something that, you know, that's someone that was tragically taken away from his, his kids. He's a great dad. I can attest to this. I knew him since we were teenagers. And I, and I know how this went down. And I know that he's not getting the justice that's required in, in Kitsap County. And, and we're going to be doing, uh, focusing a campaign soon. Um, we're, we're not quite there yet. But, um, you know, please just, when these, when these things occur, whether it is to Native people, whether it is to Black people, understand that they're not, that these things don't happen in isolation. There's an algorithm there. They're connected. And, and, and so the, it's, it's a combination of melanin oftentimes, but also, also a vulnerability, oftentimes mental health. Mental health is a huge component of this. And so you know, th this is going back to the origin of the conversation with Jarrell regarding, we need people that are peacekeepers, not people with guns. You know, there's a, a unfortunate, I don't need to, you know, tell you anything, uh, uh, um, Rachel, about, you know, the tragedy that happened on, on your reservation with, with uh, the sister uh, Renee Davis. And, and she was tragically taken with us, taken from us. And this happens over and over again with Native people and mental health and unaddressed mental health issues. So if I had to say two things is number one, just stay on the lookout for this campaign that we're gonna be, we're gonna be moving toward. But number two, um, you know, <laughs> within our native communities, we also, it's not just within Seattle, it's not just within Atlanta that we need to, 
question and defund these police officers. We need to look for models that are different than this colonial version within our native communities as well. We need to push our people because they have guns the same way. And those people oftentimes are trained by the same police academies that have the same implicit bias, that have the same, same killer instincts and are doing the same things to our people. So we need to push our communities as well. It can't just be in the cities. This is not just the city issue. This is also within reservation. So, you know, continue to do that, do that work and assume that it's just as bad on reservation. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, thank you for being here today and, and sharing everything that you have. Um, I know we're, we're getting close to our time, but I want to go ahead and um, pass it over to Matt to um, go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Jossie. I always enjoy uh, connecting with you, listening to you, and uh, with the other panelists we've hopped on. Uh, when I went down to that Capitol Hill, looking for the bros to drum with, uh, I heard this very distinct, loud voice from around the corner to, to find uh, Giassi at a, another thing he excels at, and that's talking trash to other <laughs> basketball players. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> I posted a link up to his uh, uh, break dances with wolves, not dances with wolves as I once uh, mistook it for. So uh, if I find his podcast there, so <laughs> true story. <laughs> All right, uh, we're very honored to have um, our last panelist, uh, Ariana Nason, uh, is an Ashinaabe, and please forgive me if I uh, correctly. Uh, she's a, a healing justice facilitator, disability activist, and abolitionist residing in Minneapolis. So coming to us from uh, the heart of where all this uh, has started. Uh, Ariana works towards restoring health from within, both on an individual and community level, and finds uh, the time to rest often as possible. Thank you very much for, for joining us, and um, look, uh, thank you. Hey. Thank you all for having me. Um, so just for the sake of time, I am going to try and ramble off as much information in a concise and accessible way as possible. Um, so, so please forgive the haphazard nature. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. I am Anishinaabe from the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, which if you're looking at the Great Lakes region, it's the very western tip of Lake Superior. Um, so that's where I grew up and I've spent uh, my formative years in my adult life in the south side of Minneapolis here. And I actually have, I currently reside and have resided on the block um, where the memorial site now is. I, I reside on the block where George Floyd was murdered at the hands of the police. Um, <laughs> so it is, it's been a, a real intense, like quick immersion experience in, in both life as an organizer, life as a community member, and life as an individual experiencing all of these things at the same time. Um, so just a little bit of background, because um, I know some, some folks might know the work, some folks might not, and that's totally okay, because I think knowing everything is a weird elitist construct, and so let me tell you what we have going on. Um, MPD 150, we are an abolitionist collective. Uh, we are a collective, we are not a formal organization. Um, we are a participatory, horizontally organized effort by local organizers, researchers, artists, activists, elders, and youth. Uh, it is not the project of any single organization, and we do acknowledge in, that we are sitting on the shoulders of the work that many organizations and individuals have been doing for years and years and years. Um, as long as police have been in existence, there has been work to defund them, to abolish them, and to have them be not a thing anymore. Um, so I want to be really clear that this work is not new. This language is not new. Um, and so we hope that with this process that we are developing in terms of, of shifting the narrative towards a police-free future and really uh, dreaming up of a future that is life-giving and sustainable, like we're hoping that we can keep planting these seeds in different communities and also support individual communities and individual people within, within their own life, within their own movement, within the work. Um, to be able to cultivate kind of like what we refer to as sort of like a garden of abolition, a garden uh, that we are dreaming the future of. So MPD 150, uh, we started, uh, also check us out. We have uh, the, the thing we're known for, <laughs> um, the thing that has really pushed a lot of stuff forward is that in 2017, 
um, we realized that the Minneapolis Police Department would be celebrating their 150 year anniversary. So uh, we decided to put out a 150 year performance evaluation of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and so that included a historical timeline that goes back uh, probably about 100 years really before the Minneapolis Police Department was founded. And then it moves forward through all of the attempts at reform, all of the police violence. Um, we have been doing a massive amount of research for the last five years to try and actually document uh, all of the violence and death at the hands of police so that we can properly honor them and honor our ancestors and like how we are moving forward to, to keep this work in good health. Um, so uh, that is the main collective I work with. Um, I am also closely aligned uh, with Reclaim the Block. I am not officially with them, but I am uh, an affiliated and supportive organizer and uh, with Black Visions Collective, which is also on the ground here in Minneapolis. And I, uh, myself and our collective MPD 150, uh, we do follow the leadership directly coming from Black Visions Collective. Uh, because as, as, as everyone has mentioned, like this is a really important moment specifically um, because a lot of like young black queer like femme, female, trans organizers specifically, a lot of black youth have been doing this work and pushing this thing forward for a really long time. So I want to keep continuing to honor the leadership that has been there and the leadership that is, is moving collectively forward as a whole. And that is super, super important to do. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share a quick, a quick little story about Target specifically as well. Um, because this, I, I, I am all of, I, I'm a, I'm a historical nerd, like I am, like I want to understand why things are the way they are now and like what the significant impact is of different sites. So in Minneapolis, um, the target that went up in flames and it was all kind of on this like same intersection of where the third police precinct is, um, this particular target is the world's worst target like it is it is significantly understaffed it is like understocked um all of the food that was ever offered there was oftentimes uh like found to be expired or about to be expired it was just really bad quality like it was gnarly and then it came out and then it was like more public knowledge for a while that this target was also the target that uh the corporate had so target is based in in minnesota um, so Target Corporate decided to use this particular Target as a testing site for all of their security measures. Um, so that is to say, like, they, they were using this Target, which primarily serves Black and Brown and Indigenous bodies, um, as testing grounds for their own policing and internal security systems. Like we were their guinea pigs. We have been their guinea pigs for years and years and years. And same with the pub that was there. Same with other corporations that were there. There were tons of predatory corporations on this particular intersection and they all went up in flames. And I am so delighted to see it. And I am so delighted to see what comes next. Um, I can't wait for the community to like really like move in because like it, it's, it's going to be under community control. There's not any other option. Um, so those are like some of the things I am truly excited to see in the city here. Um, so yeah, like there's a lot I can say about Minneapolis about like why like I really, I think being here in this moment and having an opportunity to to organize and bear witness and to lend support to all of my relatives in this moment is truly an honor. Um, I feel like it really is like kind of like divine blessing to be here right now. And it's like there's there's a long history of solidarity in Minneapolis and there's a long history of struggle in Minneapolis, even amongst ourselves. And like these are all things that are true. And it's okay that difficult things are true as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of like how we hold each other to that knowledge now or how we hold each other within that knowledge now and like keeping each other safe, keeping each other accountable and moving forward, remembering that like we really truly do want the same thing. Um, we want to be safe. Like the ultimate security is being able to decide how we keep each other safe and having that be sustained and having that be actualized and achieved. And so largely with, with what I try to do um, is to really try and kind of shift how we talk about these things, to shift abolition. Because of course, when we're saying 
abolish the police for someone who's never heard that before it sounds absolutely scary it's this idea of like well who's going to help me what's going to be here now and that's not an unfair question that's not an unreasonable question because historically we are also a bunch of folks that have been screwed over again and again and again and we consistently do not have the things we need no matter what it is we consistently do not have the things we need so when we are calling for defunding of the police, which is a step, a significant step towards abolition, and yes, we are calling for abolition. We are not saying defund and reform. We're like, no, nah, defund them. Like, defund these assholes. Like, if you, um, with the performance evaluation that MPD 150 put out, we also detailed in a super, like, accessible way, like, all of the different reforms that have been tried in our city. The police force that we're seeing right now is the reformed police force. Um, you cannot reform a system that is working the exact way it's intended to. You cannot reform a system that is, is working to, to protect wealth at the expense of black and brown bodies. You, can, like, you can't reform that. Um, so check out the report. Oh, God, where was I going with this now, though? <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I mean, yes, time and time again, like when calling for defunding towards abolition, folks are asking for help. So yes, so abolition for us um it doesn't mean an absence of help it means a much stronger presence of community um so it is super super unbelievably necessary to have our our own community-led resources our own community-driven initiatives and that can be whatever we want it to be and that truly is the beauty and the marvel and the wonder of the space that we're moving into is that we have this incredible opportunity to take this moment and to shape it into the future that we want to see and to shape into the future that we deserve. Because again, the, the, the police, like not even just in Minneapolis, but if you're looking at police as a whole on a national level in the United States, they are barely a 200 year old institution. There are a lot of other things that were along for a lot, around for a lot longer than 200 years that are no longer here. And I say we get rid of it. We get rid of this thing that's been harming us from day one. We get rid of this thing that was designed um, to enforce our genocide from day one and like to enforce colonization from day one. Like this is, this is something we absolutely have to move away from. We absolutely have to. And so we already have the answers within ourselves and within our communities of what we want to be seeing instead. I guarantee that you could go out and ask anyone right now, like, oh, wow, like instead of calling the cops, what do you wish would have happened? And it could even be like, wow, like I really wish that this person was able to get some education and mental health support five years ago. We're like, great, let's make sure that this never happens again. Let's defund the police and pour their seriously overinflated budget back into education, back into housing, back into sustainable, like sustainability and life affirming institutions. If we can take care of ourselves from the front, everything will follow and I guarantee, I guarantee that folks want to be taken care of. Like that's, that's, that's my itty bitty tangent here. Um, I, I, ask me a more direct question now because I can go better from there. <laughs> We, we did get uh, one uh, specifically, we've gotten a number of questions and we're going to throw them out to uh, panelists, everybody here in a, in a minute, but we did have one that was specific to uh, uh, something you brought up around um, the corporate grocery stores and it was, um, you know, asking what are the plans to address uh, food deserts that uh, can and do occur when some of these corporate grocery stores go away uh, and that was followed up with a, a community gardens question mark, urban farm arms, cooperative groceries, etc. Yeah. And no, no, that's a super valid and really real question and something that like from from the moment this all started, we're like, oh, it, like folks on the ground, like organizers knew, like community leaders knew, we're like, this, this is going to burn and we're going to have to like come up with something pretty quick. So um, the community came through and they did. Um, many this particular region of minneapolis this particular neighborhood was already at risk of becoming a food desert um and now it is it absolutely is uh so what has happened in place though is this incredible beautiful phenomenal community effort um to essentially have free grocery stores all over the place um you cannot drive anywhere in the city right now without seeing signs somewhere like redirecting you to a donation site or to a pickup site they're unbelievably well organized. They're unbelievably accessible. I would argue that getting food right now like feels different than being able to go to the grocery store, but I actually have had an easier time 
getting my needs met since the grocery store went away because I know I can walk just up the street and immediately get anything I need or I can ask one of the folks on the ground there like for something specific and they're like oh yeah I got you and then 20 minutes later it shows up like this is already happening it's already happening like there are so many drive through and drop off centers there are so many um just community members like just organizing independently to make sure that elders and folks who might have other accessibility issues are able to get their groceries and are able to go in and also get their medicines because a, a bunch of the pharmacies in the area burned down um and so that's been that's been another thing so like there's unbelievably well coordinated like immediate response efforts like folks didn't have to step in or like organizers didn't have to come in and try and make this happen the community just responded it's like oh well obviously this is going to be a need let's make sure some folks can do it um something else that's uh, a big part of minneapolis right now um and folks might have seen it blip up a little bit nationally but i really want to push this more into the national spotlight is something that has now referred to or now being referred to as the sanctuary movement. Um, so once all once the revolution started and folks were out on the streets, there was a very real concern of, whoa, how are our unhoused relatives going to be experiencing this? Are they going to be safe? Can we keep them safe? So a bunch of organizers and a bunch of like community members just went into a hotel and took it over. They just took it over and they took over the entire hotel and for a few weeks were able to essentially turn it into a very like overwhelmingly run but a well organized run site where folks were able to stay and were able to rest and were able to get their needs met there was medical stuff on site or medical staff on site um unfortunately the owner of the hotel did evict all of our unhoused relatives a few days ago um so but again community has been like well the city is failing everyone right now the state is failing everyone right now like we're going to take care of this so there are a bunch of uh public parks in the area and uh organizers again took over all the parks to make sure that these sanctuary sites are going to remain intact that they're going to uh, remain supplied and that there's going to be like sanitary stations there as well. So there's porta potties, hand washing stations. Um, again, like every single day, there's a huge push and effort to make sure that everybody's needs are met. Like there's constantly like public calls, folks are dropping stuff mm -hmm. off. Like before I came here today, I was just like, well, what are some of the weird things that I know folks might seem a little bit more apprehensive like to go out and buy? So like I bought like a couple cartons of cigarettes and a bunch of dog food to drop it off because you know what people need their creature comforts and their creatures need to be comfortable like we rely so heavily on on the things that help us regulate our own nervous system so like yeah harm reduction like give people the things that they need for better things in the long run no matter what um and i really 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 love seeing it i love seeing the way the ways that people are stepping up like like this shouldn't be the option to handle a housing crisis, but it is good that it's being handled so well by the community. I love that. Um, it's uh, great examples of the community as we should be taking care of one another. Thank you for, for sharing that and a good model for communities across the country to be, to be looking at. Um, we do have some other questions that we'd like to throw out to whoever the panelists, um, if you can stay on for a tad longer, um, get some, mm -hmm. whomever would like to, specific, whoever would like to, uh, was around um, uh, the, the language and the importance of, of the language that we use, especially when we're discussing racial justice issues. So uh, the question was, you know, we heard sacrifice versus solidarity, giving voice uh, to uh, versus amplifying autonomous zones versus organized protest, uh, that there's a lot of language being used out there. And can anybody um, speak to the importance of the language we use in these discussions, uh, particularly around racial justice issues? Mm. Mm. I mean, I, again, speaking, speaking for myself and what I'm experiencing here in Minneapolis in particular is that like 
there are a lot of approach, ap approaches to how this is going to happen, and none of them are wrong. Like, as long as they're community driven, as long as they're community led, um, like, that's really what matters. Um, I think the, the only like hard language differential that like I consistently want to make is that when we say defund the police, we do also mean abolish the police, like defunding towards a step, not defunding towards reform. Um, we're not trying to reform the police. We're not trying to have police be a presence in our life like this anymore. We want them gone, 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 gone. And anyone that tries to talk to me about reform, I just I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm bored. Can we move on? I'm like, can we move on? <laughs> and like with, and again, like, it's also really important that we give ourselves a lot of, give each other a lot of space to be messy, to ask questions, to make mistakes. There's gonna be a lot of mistakes and human error in this process because there's also a lot of emotion and personal well-being tied into this work as there should be. And so it's not going to be perfect. There's not going to be an across the board consensus at any point in time and that is fine. Like an across the board consensus is part of, or like requiring an across the board consensus it plays into the system, plays into part of the problem about how we are here to begin with. Like something isn't going to be best for every single community. Like it is going to be up to folks to take personal responsibility, personal accountability um, with themselves, with each other, within their community to be able to have these conversations and figure it out because they're absolutely necessary. And yes, they are uncomfortable and they're going to be hard. And this is part of the necessary work. You, would either uh, of you uh, want to address that one, otherwise we can hop on to one of the next questions. Okay, go on to the next one. Uh, is ask, uh, can any of the panelists foresee the dismantling of other levels of enforcement, such as Border Patrol, ICE, prison systems, the military? And uh, says, thank you, hands up to you all for the good work that you're doing. Yes, we said Chan in the street, the whole damn system is guilty as hell. <laughs> and so, um, so that's exactly, like I said, it, it, we have to get to the core of how these laws were made, the doctrine of discovery. Of course, that is something that we, um, especially within the Native American community, has been pushing. Um, to to um um to just basically get rid of the doctrine of discovery um but yes with ice all of that all of it and i and i feel that right now um organizers across the nation is looking at this opportunity um to get rid of um the the system to get rid of the the entire system i got a call today from um, the son of Dick Gregory, Baba Gregory. And he was like, sis, what, you know, this is a great time for, for us to organize around the mascot. And, you know, he was like, the NFL seems to all of a sudden want to help, <laughs> you know, after, especially when they fired Kaepernick. I mean, they never really, they just wanted black and brown people to just throw the ball and run, you know, and make them money. But right now, okay, well, if, if they're starting to get a, uh, a heart because they know that boycotts are coming, you know, all right, well, let's change the Redskins. Let's change the Cleveland Indians. Let's change the Atlanta Braves. All of the things that even Bob R. Dick Gregory and, and um, Russell Means and Dennis Banks, so many people was fighting on that your mascot, you, you know. Um, shout out to Amanda Blackhorse, you know, Tara Hauska, you know that was doing a great work. So, I mean, this is a great time for us to demolish and look at this, I mean, demolish the system and begin to re-examining and pushing for a new world, a new America for us um, today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, I think we'll take one or two more questions and then um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, here's one that came up and any of you that are on here, the panels, you can answer. Um, 
says, is it ever appropriate for white people to draw attention to opportunities for issues with intersectionality to black or native organizers? Only to your own people. <laughs> Like have have the conversations with your cousins, please, and also trust that we are having the conversation in house. <laughs> I second that. Um, I also, you know, it was funny when we was in Standing Rock, and all, and those that were in Standing Rock could kind of well will relate with what I'm about to say. When we was getting tear gassed and arrested and attacked by dogs and rubber bullet and all of that stuff, when that wave of white folks came and said, hey, we're willing to be on the front line and to organize and, and come here. And, and we started calling them arrestables. And which was amazing because we was like, oh, y'all want this heat? Like y'all want this smoke? <laughs> because we've been getting this smoke for over 500 years. So y'all want this? Okay, go ahead. Get on the front line, get that tear gas, get that rubber bullet, <laughs> get the name called. If you want that smoke, Mo, yes. So all the white, white folks that want that smoke of what we've been dealing with for over 500 years, then yes, yes, come stand, and, and get beat by batons, get followed by the FBI and Tiger Swan and all of the, the different oh. militia groups. Oh, I forgot there. about them. Exactly, all of that. You want all of that? <laughs> then come on. Because guess what? That's, what? that's our reality. And if you only want to be that for a moment, then, then you know even more so what we have been dealing with for over 500 years. So yes. Get that smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I think it goes back directly to what uh, Josie was saying about uh, not just stand in solidarity, but stand in sacrifice. Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, we'll do uh, one more. Um, and then uh, let's go down here. Uh, what did the panelists suggest for personal individual rejuvenation so if folks can stay plugged in uh, to the struggle? but without getting massively burnt out? A common question, I know. Matt, Rachel, Ariana, are y'all burnt out? Like, how do y'all feel? Do I look burnt out? <laughs> <laughs> do we ever okay, I mean, to, to be direct, and I don't mean this with salt in the wound, but salt in my mouth a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, we don't i don't i don't get the luxury of being fully burnt out like that just doesn't happen um it just doesn't happen in this moment um like everyone needs to be there and this work should not kill us this work needs to be sustainable um fighting like Part of the reason why the MPD 150 collective started was because of how bad the burnout was within the organizing, uh, like the social community here, um, particularly after the death of Jamarge Clark by hands of the police. Um, there was also an 18 day occupation of the fourth police precinct, which he was murdered in front of. Um, so one of the things that we really had to do to address the burnout was to really do a massive shift in thinking about how we approach this work. And sometimes it really is going to require a lot of inner work to figure out how to shift how you approach it. Um, so if you're, if you're it, again, like it, it sounds simple, but this idea that we're running a marathon, not a single race, this is going to be a long-term thing. Um, practice giving yourself permission to turn off your phone for the evening. Practice giving yourself permission to ask for help. Like have a friend that like maybe you or one or two people are always just checking in with each other and like with consent and like with with boundaries established but just like hey um it's has everyone eaten today have you taken your meds today have you uh like really thought about the last time you drank water are your shoulders down like is your posture good like there are all kinds of things that are like those small actions that we need to be taking to prevent burnout at the front end because ultimately, and I really do believe this, that the work that we are doing 
like that we set up ourselves to do, the work that we choose to do, cannot also be the thing that kills us, cannot also be the thing that caused burnout so that we completely have to leave to, to recoup. Like it just can't, like that can't keep happening and yet it does. And so this is also for me, like as much of an answer about like shifting how we do our work in the movement and, and recognizing that it's not about moment to moment, um, it's about life to life um, and staying connected. So keep doing things that restore some sense of connection for yourself, whether that be spiritual connection, emotional connection, connection to community, connection to family, and you get to say no. You get to say no and you get to tell people to fuck off sometimes. You really do. <laughs> Can I add to that as well? Um, I think what's really important for us, you know, is to get back to our spiritual roots, um, our spiritual ceremonies. That was something that I believe that everyone saw how we live as Native people, as Indigenous people, um, and Standing Rock that, you know, after the front line, we went straight to sweat. After the front line, we had various ceremonies, you know, whether it was the horse ceremony. Oh my God, I, there was not one dry eye when the horses came. Well, I'm about to get all emotional again, but when the horses came, do you all remember that? When the horses came to come and heal us and give us their strength and their medicine, and they just circled, it was on the outside and, and they just circled on the inside over and over and over and over again. Oh my God, it was so, so beautiful. You know, it's really important that, you know, exactly what my sister here said, you know, turning off your phone, but it's even more important to, to take your shoes off and to connect with the ground, to connect with the ground, to, to, um, to connect with those two-legged, the four-legged, you know, the winged ones, all all of our creation of um, the creator's creations and to quiet ourselves and to quiet our spirit finding that solace in um in the water in the air in the land the woods whatever you know and getting out the concrete jungle just to get away i think it's really important as well and in this time we are really finding something to be able to motivate you motivate that's going to keep you going I look at my sons every day you know I have two sons a 19 year old and a nine year old and I'm like I do not want them to do to fight the fights that we're fighting today I don't want them to that means that the ball was dropped somewhere that means that all of this work that we are doing a ball was dropped and I don't want us to drop a ball where my son is out there chanting 20 years from now black lives matter that me so i the, so my sons motivate me and my family motivates me and the people motivate me and it does get it does get tired i'm 42 years old i was born in the longest walk which was the the protest from alcatraz san francisco to washington dc i was in my mother's womb hearing the aim song over and over and over again and hearing the you know and hearing the chants and hearing um kwame torre and chief ernie Longwalker and warrior woman and russell means and everyone saying a lot of the same things we're saying today and i don't want my sons to have those type of conversations i want my sons to actually be peace and have happiness and love and enjoy to go outside and play and not having to worry about hiding from a police officer if a police officer is just driving by you know, so that's what most, so I would say my, my, my answer to those that want to know about burnout, find something that motivates you. And the first thing in regards to, I always say an activist is a person that, that activates for change. That means that you're activating for change. So that's an activist. You know, so if you're activating for change and you have something that, man, I, I just can't tweet, I got to do something. It's always something that you like, I got to do something, <laughs> you know, and hold on to that. Hold on to that, what, what it is that you have to, that you want to do and let that motivate you every day. And then of course, counseling, mental health. I feel all of, I mean, I, I was in Ferguson. I was in, I mean, I was a lot of places <laughs> and Standing Rock everywhere. And even, you know, I heard a pop earlier. My son says to me, my nine-year-old, he said, mom, 
he said, why did you, he said, that's not good that you jumped when you heard a pop in the mall. And he was like, that's not good. And I said, I know, I, I'm just, I'm, that's how I'm triggered because I don't know if that's a flashbang, a gunshot or anything. And I, and I, I tense up. So even July 4th, I was in the a, in a military, but I do feel like I have PTSD. So July 4th, I'm shaking like this, like this. And, and that's not good. That's not good. So mental health and, and getting, seeking that help is really important. We want to thank uh, <clears throat> all the panelists. Thank everybody who, who joined in today. Uh, very inspiring and encouraging uh, words and uh, conversation happening. I'm, I feel very blessed just to, to sit and listen to, to all of you. Um, I do have to throw out there because you have uh, two Lakotas on here that uh, on this day, 1876, uh, our ancestors wiped out General Crook at the Battle of the Rosebud. So, you know, if, they, if people try to say things are impossible, think about the Lakota nation taking out uh, the U.S. military, and eight days later, taking out Custer and all them too. So yeah, we you wild. These same. We <laughs> That's wild. what I'm saying. <laughs> you already know the wild Oglalas. <laughs> wild Thank you all. <laughs> and I, um, I want to say a couple things before we go. Also, um, just again, thanking all of you panelists on here, and um, to my sister, I just want to thank you for bringing up just the healing of our ceremonies because I think that's a part of the conversation that 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 does get left out and 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 when we talk about um these justices that 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 we're seeking you know native people are on the the, the front lines of our environmental justice and the only reason I continue to bring it up is because it, it's something that we have to continue to work on it's something that we have to continue to be involved in because if we want a world of equality, we have to have somewhere to practice it. And, and so we can't talk about racial justice without environmental justice. If we want somewhere to, to practice that and to live that and for, you know, our young sons to, to grow up and to be those peaceful men that we talk about. So I'm thankful for the conversations of the parents on here that we talk about a healthy future for our children. I have a two-year-old and a 14-year-old and a 21-year-old and 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 I worry every single day about their futures and so this work is important and and you're right we have dropped a ball if 20 years from now our kids are on still on the same front lines that we are all on um, so I'm thankful for each one of you that take time out of your day and away from your families to share these words to share this education to um, Tell us the things that you're doing so that we can be involved, so that we can be better allies, that we can build solidarity, we can support one another, and we can have these conversations about ceremonies and front lines and different things because that we built that that you know that that solidarity together. And so, just um, thank you guys for for being here and for allowing us to use our platforms to raise the voices of our black relatives and being able to truly make sure that that is the work that is front and center right now. And, and that we're able to get these voices out to maybe places that it hadn't before. So um, thank you guys. And thank you for every person that has listens to this, tuned in, um, watched any part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Selection, uh, our behind the scenes. Jossie, I'm waiting for my teriyaki. Yes. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Uh, we'll be uh, posting this on YouTube, I believe, and uh, check it out Let there. Let me know when, Matt. All right, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.